friends and family of uh, FPG. Today we're going to be talking about uh, how to do the FDD review in, in mid-process. This is module 10, so we're uh, crossing the halfway point of the Franchise Sales and Lead Generation Academy. Uh, who here has ever like lost the deal uh, because of the terms of the FDD? Anybody? Yeah, so pretty common. Uh, anybody think about a time that they lost a deal with the FDD just because the candidate misinterpreted what was in the FDD or just the they just all the things added up. It was an additive effect where they just got scared about all the things that potentially the franchisor could do to wipe them out. Anybody have a story like that? Bryce, your hands up. Do you want to share? Uh, yeah, a lot of it just had to do with certain parameters in terms of, um, you know, the initial investment, making sure you understand, uh, you know, some of that stuff, uh, understanding kind of the timeline to open some territory parameters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. People trying to look for wiggle room, um, and misinterpreting certain things. So making sure you unblur those lines is definitely my experience. Was it a, um, was it a fair FDP or were they wise to have? issues and concerns um i think it depends on which section um and which brand truth be told i could probably speak to a couple stories and ultimately i've dealt with some fdds of course that are stronger than others um i would say for the most part it's typically the candidate though that is misinterpreting and the fdds are usually pretty fair uh, christian you said you seemed like you had something you wanted to share uh, i don't know i guess we all go through that right i think there's always a few sections within every FDD that uh, some can be, uh, can come off as really brutal and heavy handed. Yes. Um, you know, I, I've tried to really make a real conscious effort to make our, take all the ways you can say no out of the FDD um, as often as possible. And I think- yeah, I'm a big believer in scrubbing the FDD. I think yeah. they need to be one-sided um, because the, the franchisor has to protect uh, the investments of everybody that proceeded One protect the brand. The however would be, uh, I don't think the attorney should have free reign and go unchecked because no. I haven't met too many franchise attorneys that understand uh, or have a great appreciation for the business and, and what it takes to buy into a business like this. Right, so there's a lot of protections that the attorneys write into the FDD that quite frankly, the brand doesn't need because either A, the protections are covered elsewhere uh, mm -hmm. or B, the scenarios are so improbable uh, yep. that, that, the, that they're unlikely to occur. Um, and then, you know, C, there's very little litigation with most franchisors. So in the face of a conflict, generally it gets worked out. So, you know, so I don't, I'm not a big fan of erroneous uh, and very heavy handed FD, FDDs where that have baked in deal killers uh, because I think the, uh, the risk uh, of the, losing the deal isn't worth the reward of protections that you actually don't need because somebody walked away from the deal, right? So we're going to talk a lot about that today and kind of where these things happen to occur. Um, but we also lose deals, I find, because uh, people are generally surprised. You know, they'll read the FDD and should before they hire an attorney. Uh, but there's sometimes there's a cumulative effect of the language uh, that can create an overall spook factor. And people uh, either A, they, they get scared, B, uh, creates a credibility issue with the brand. Uh, and then it, and then it can be, a, a, even though it's not one particular deal killer, it's a cumulative effect. Uh, Rini. So the stuff that I, where I, it's in particular to registration states and the lag between in, in how we have done it. So I'd love to hear how other people have done it is we wait for someone in that state because we're small to come to us and then we try to keep them engaged while we go through the process and we do seem to meet attorney issues also and what I can say and what I can't say and I would love to have some guidance with that. Yeah, there, there's states the timing doesn't work on that like Illinois and Maryland and 
the state of Washington and New York, you know, you're never going to keep somebody on the hook for as long as it's going to take for them to ratify. And then we it could work, but it's it. But at the end of the day, my, my answer would be to yeah, don't be half pregnant. Yeah. You could go in or go out. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to time uh, the state. Yeah. Some, it's just a rubber stamp or a signature and you're, you're done. And there's quite a few registration states like that, but yeah, forget New York, forget Maryland, forget Washington, forget California, and a host of others. The timing won't work. Uh, okay. Christian, I have two right point in Maryland, so that tells yeah. me. A lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. Right, pick your battles. Where do you want to play, and focus on those, and just yeah. accept the fact that you know what, you know you can you can do so much with your advertising today. Um, just be straight up and say, you know what, we're not going to mess with New York right now because it takes six months, right? If you're not in, like, I have to be in California because that's where we're based, and they can be they can be treacherous. But I mean, for the for the four deals I could maybe get out of Maryland, yes, you know, I can fry bigger fish fish somewhere else, right? And I'm going to go on a limb and in November vote smaller government, uh, Leslie. <laughs> Uh, well, let's thank you. Find my 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 button there. Um, so I I would love Joe to hear from you or anybody else on the call. Kind of how do you handle that? You've got a really good candidate in California or some of these states, and you know, let's say it's March, right? And you know, nothing's going to happen for most brands for six months. Like, how do you, you know, how do you handle somebody? Go ahead, Corey, who's the master at that. Well, representing California brands over the last four or five years, yeah, and and New York and Maryland, yeah, um, right. <laughs> and some other doozies. Um, you know, I just ping them. I mean, if that's your question, Leslie, I just I try to keep in really good contact regularly. You know, text message uh, I find works really well. You know, um, I think it's a little more personal. It's a little more accessible um, as opposed to the email and. Um, I mean, there's no good answer. I mean, well, Les, Joe, right, but before that, don't you kind of do a countdown with the candidates when they're inquiring? Say, look, you know, three months from now, we're going to go through this situation. So put the oh. date in your calendar. And, you know, this has got to be your decision day. Or you're going to hang out there indefinitely. Y yes. Yes. We so do try that to manage too. that up front. Yeah. 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 So I would just say maximum transparency, you know. So a lot of times I find myself into the weeds talking about, how you know the FTC and the in the federal government and how they're involved and then the states and this is a requirement and so this is what has to happen. So I you know yeah just maximum transparency and a lot of times then you know when I sort of nudge them for hey we gotta we gotta really put the pedal to the metal here to beat the you know you know we gotta have this deal done by March 30th or whatever uh, I get a lot more buy-in on that. Right. So to Joe's point, yeah, but maximum transparency, explain the process. And then I get I get better buy-in. So just to recap, so Corey, Corey, like the idea when you start approach when you're within 120 days of these deadlines is you, you put the deadline in the books and say we need a decision by this day. And for those that go past that day, uh, you stay in communication. Um, how regularly would you touch them, Corey? Two weeks, four weeks? What would you do? Depends on the candidate. I mean, that's where a little bit of the art of the deal comes in. Yeah. I mean, some candidates would need, but but I would say no less than than once a week. I mean, even even for people who seemingly don't need it. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I, I I like I like to hit him once a week, uh, even to the point where even if I feel like I'm being a little bit annoying, I just I just it, it's a check in, it's a touch base. Got it. That's more than I would do. I used to do every uh, two to f two three weeks, something like that. Uh, Leslie, you had something else you wanted to add? So, I mean, I'm a broker. So, you know, Canada, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I continue to drip people with general information. Yes. But kind, but kind of unlike a brand where I, you know, I'm dripping about a specific brand and a specific offering. I'm, I'm kind of, does anybody have any thoughts for me of how you, I mean, how do you say to that person, you know, hey, it's, it's April, you're in California. A lot of the brands that I'm going to work with we can't do anything for six months. And so, you know, do I just leave them hanging for, for six months? 
So my answer would be the same thing what Corey does. You know, when you're within 120 days, some of these registration states, you have that. So you flag it early. And just say, if you like a brand, you know, these things happen. It's unfortunate, uh, but that's what they do. And put, you know, put it, have them put it in the calendar and pencil and say, you know, you, this is when the agreement would need to be executed by. Uh, otherwise, we could be hanging out there indefinitely, which is in nobody's best interest. But that's, but I'm talking about like people who, like I had this happen this year. It's like I had this slew of people that came in like April, like April. And like, we're not going to get a deal. Like my process is, is, you know, a good 90 to 120 days right. before people are doing anything. So, you know, you know, I, I actually don't do a lot in registration states. So I found myself a little bit at a loss as, you know, what do I do here? Like, yeah, what do that's I do? very interesting. So here's the thing, uh, Leslie, because you're in the world of franchise consulting, you're not representing a brand. You're not making an offer. Right. Right. So you have leeways of communicating that a brand doesn't. Attorneys will tell the brand a few different things. Like, don't do anything that will resembling making an offer, whatever that means, you know definition attached. So, so we drip them news, new openings, new signings, other parts of the area, customer satisfaction criteria, um, could be a nice social media post, limited time offers. If like it's, if it's a restaurant, you just find a reason to keep them in the loop. Um, and if they're interested in a particular brand, um, yeah, probably reaching out to the franchisor and putting together a communication strategy uh, that they'll execute on behalf of your client is probably a good way to go. Uh, and then the second piece would be there's a lot of content, just generic, how to buy franchising, maybe how to overcome startup fears, how to write a business plan. Yeah, kind of generic, I think, content. You literally could do anything because you're not making the offer. Now, unless the FTC tightens up on those guidelines where yeah, you know, they say you are making an offer. You know, in other words, you work because you're compensated by the franchisor. You now work for the franchisor, but I, I'm I don't know that to be the case today. And then to to really solve the problem uh, for everybody on October fifteenth, uh, there we're now doing pre sell for uh, the Amazon soon to be Amazon dot com best selling book. Uh, uh, the ultimate guide to responsible franchising by yours truly, which will have all that stuff in there. Mike, it's so robust. It might take 120 days to read. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a thoughtful gift for all occasions. So the shameless book plug. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bet you wish we pulled the plug on that conversation about 30 seconds earlier, Leslie. Well done. Pre, uh, pre shameless book plug. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on and talk about where uh, the FDD is in the uh, in the process. So people send out FDDs. I've, I've had people tell me, I'm not going to talk to somebody unless they've gone through the FDD because I don't want to waste my time. And I would be one like, well, I wouldn't worry about them wasting your time. Why don't you not waste their time and have some respect uh, for the entrepreneur, the time, money, energy, and risk that they're bringing to the table? Uh, and then uh, I even see franchisors sometimes invest in what I think is too much time and, and moving them through the process, almost afraid to give them the FTD in fear of a deal killer surfacing, which from time to time inevitably does. And then all that work and that time goes by the wayside. <laughs> so in the FPG process, uh, we uh, we put the FTD review and FTD uh, reading um, kind of on the front part of early. So I want everybody to have a robust brand story before they get the FTD. My thinking is don't give them the rules of the game until they know what the game is because they don't have context, right? So in the in our step one interview and overview, we're giving them a really good idea plus all the downloadable content, plus the content that's available on the website uh, before they ever get an FDD, they'll know and should be able to play back what makes this business unique, what makes it profitable, what makes it valuable to the customer, what makes it scalable, sustainable for the long haul. And although they couldn't tell you exactly, they might, you know, how it, there's some line of sight potentially 
between what the business is and what they're trying to achieve. Like they could see it playing out, not with a high degree of probability, but with a high degree of possibility. All right, so so it's the possibility is kind of, for me, is the, um, it creates some emotional deposits in the emotional bank because the FDD can be a withdrawal. I remember the, you know, so I've been doing presentations on this. I remember my first IFA was probably something like 22 years ago and I was asked to sit down with a panel of attorneys and a couple of brand dev guys and talk about franchise development best practices. And one attorney uh, came out and said, you know what, our franchise sales guys, they use the FDD as a sales tool. And I kind of laughed. And he looked at me and said, what are you laughing about? I just, I said, you know, I've been recruiting franchisees for more than 20 years. And yeah, you know, not once have I ever heard, you know, I, I was on the fence, you know, and then I got your FDD. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, let's have some more conversation because the FDD is not a sales tool. If anything, you, I hope it's a neutral, but often, you know, it's a, in the words of my 26 and 27 year old sons, it dampens the vibe. Uh, whatever that means. Bryce, what does that mean? That's your age. It means it's not very exciting to be having to deal with and, and read through. God, perfect. Uh, Thank you for interpreting that. For it, the it lowers the shizzle. <laughs> Jason, what does that mean? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't okay. know. Corey, elaborate. <laughs> well, I apparently, watched Snoop, there's... I watched Snoop Dogg last night on. Oh. The voice. I don't know. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't exactly know what I do during the course of the day to lower shizzle. And I'm, I'm conversely, I'm not sure what I could do to raise it. So I, <laughs> I live a, a shizzle free existence apparently and probably will continue to do so. So you can kind of see in our six, six step process, uh, the non shizzle occurs generally in uh, step two, uh, the FDD review, right? Now, from a what does it look like from a deal pacing uh, environment, right? So the content should get somebody probably 25, 30%. You know, if, if all the way up here is 100% and they're signing the franchise agreement, let's call this 25 or 30%. Your website downloadable content and, and available online content streams should get them somewhere between the 30 to 50 yard line. Okay. And then you know, your upfront education and interview pieces, uh, when you're educating them on the concept itself, probably should get them to the you know, 40 or 50 yard line if they're not there already. All right. That way, when they get the FDD, here I show it as a flat line, right? Uh, it could be this, right? Yeah. If this is bankrupt, if this is like if this is your emotional bank, right? And you've made these deposits, okay. The FDD, you got to be able to cover that withdrawal, right? In case it's a withdrawal, otherwise the deal falls apart. Now, the uh, for me, the ideal situation when you're going through the FDD review, uh, they're going to save themselves. I, I know, actually, that's not what I want them to save themselves. When they're done, I want them to sell themselves this. I don't necessarily like it, but I can live with it, right? So the goal before they leave the FDD stage for me would be identify and eliminate deal killers uh, and let them know what's normal in franchising and why things need to be the way they are to be. In other words, bring them into the world of the franchisor and why certain terms and things are stated the way that they're stated. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, and then also show them what's what's kind of normal with other chains uh, so they can kind of level set, you know, kind of what their expectations are. So I do think there's some uh, education and informing. I do think it's a lot about clarity. And uh, a lot of times because these are written sometimes not in plain English uh, and more in attorney speak, it's more about intention. Like what does this really say? And how does it really play out practically in the world, real world? You know, they might somebody might say, "Look, if I'm late for one royalty payment, you guys can seize my business." Well, let's look at that. Uh, so let's you know, take them to the point in place of you know opportunities to cure. But here, if you pay that, you're back in compliance. 
Uh, so there is, uh, there's no, I'm taking your business. Now, if you go to this section and you do it six times in a year, yeah, then you lose your opportunity to cure. But I would, can we both agree that would be on you and not on the franchisor? And in the world of, you know, direct deposit uh, or ATH or automatic debits, that that should never happen. You know, so there's, again, education, how things kind of play out in the real world. And then there's always the feel felt found. Remember what that is? That's kind of the old uh, Tom Hopkins uh, sales methodology uh, back in the 80s and 90s. I, uh, I feel, okay, I can understand why you feel that way. I worked with another candidate and they felt the same way. Let me tell you what they found. It's kind of a way to introduce kind of a word story, you know, into the equation. And then, you know, sometimes uh, there are legitimate uh, deal killers in there. Like the one I hate is when the franchisor offers the franchisee a protected territory, but then reserves the right, okay, to put a, a competition, a competitive brand that they own in the using the same materials, but different trademarks in the same uh, territory. So here's a franchisor. They've got the client list, right? They've got the IP. Okay, they're you know, they reserve the right to really just go in there and decimate. Uh, the franchise or the franchisee rather. And if you're franchisee, how do you mitigate that risk? You know, you can't, right? So I hate stuff like that. And that's like an agreement I would never sign. And I would uh, tell a client to negotiate that out or walk because that's a disruption of good faith. Yes, Christian. I feel the same way about that. And, and the challenge I have, and maybe you guys can share with me, because personally, I think territories are ridiculous. I think they're totally stupid, but they're... Well, why would you say that? Like, what's stupid about protecting a trade area? Because so much business can come from anywhere, particularly with the internet. And it's not like you as... Well, that's a certain type of business. What about restaurant or retail? But still, you know, I want to reserve, I make a reservation and I'm online on open table or whatever. At the yeah. end of the day, the, we can't make the customer choose where they want to buy. Right. We have no way to, to force the customer to buy one. No, place but I don't think we don't have the, that right. Yeah. That's not the point of uh, protecting territories. Let's take, let's just stay with food because that's an easy one. Right. Right. I, you know, I don't the average, it, so. The customer is going to drive eight minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the typical drive time. Corey, is that going up at all during the years? Uh, you know, I don't know. Eight to ten minutes. So uh, I could I could tell you nobody would nobody would buy a restaurant franchise if there wasn't a protected territory for the exact point you're making. Yeah. So so you, so they protect that particular base. Like you don't give them two choices under the same brand uh, where they can compete. I will tell you. If you guys remember, I started my career with Subway back in the 80s when they had 300 restaurants. I will tell you, it does make a difference. And sales would suffer uh, when Subway put them too close. Sales would go down 20 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, when you lose 20 percent of sales, you don't lose 20 percent EBITDA. You lose 40 percent EBITDA. Right. Right. And the equity attached to that. Right. And now Subway didn't offer protected territories. They never really had to pay the bill on that. Uh, because the, the survivors would buy out the guys that got hurt. And, you know, the agreements were such that whether they, if they wanted to sue for damages, they couldn't. It was just there was no cheating down that tunnel. They just licked their wounds and moved on. But it's really, I think, Subway, Subway's business practices really put that on the radar screen for other people. So I, I wouldn't. So I can understand why you say that, like. Like I also work with Sandler, Sandler franchisees. Can, it's in a virtual training business. They do business right. all over the country. Territory means less, right? In a scenario, we're, like we're the that. same. We're business to business. But I would tell you, franchisees, when I talk to them, like territory is a big deal at the start. But the way your Google flags get planted today, the way customers find your location listing, territory to me is less relevant than ever. And I, quite frankly, if, if they yeah. wanted to, I mean, why would they want those restrictions on themselves? 
for where they well, go. Territory just means that's that's a good point. Territory, let's just define it. Territory generally doesn't describe in a lot of businesses where you can do business. It, it discovers how far distribution is from you, right? So so you're more likely to do business in that scenario. Like so, like uh, you know, Rini works for Spoil Rotten Photography. You know, people in a higher ticket will have a broader area. But if I live in Richmond, Virginia, I'm not going to hire a photographer in Charlottesville to drive out to four hours to Richmond and pay him $100 an hour uh, to commute uh, as a general rule. So so there's natural trade areas and shopping patterns that gets created. Yes, Rini. So this is actually a big deal with us right now because we are doing some territory mapping. and. I see exactly what Christian is saying because we have some schools who are accustomed to dealing with a particular franchisee and then we have a new franchisee come into that area and then that territory has to be divided now because the one franchisee has just gone everywhere and then we, it's all this controversy between the, the older franchisee and the new franchisee and then we have the customer because we're business to business also and then they don't understand why they're losing their favorite people. So that's actually a really good point. And that's under the FDD. So a lot of times this stuff's covered under the FDD. So that's a franchisee doing business. I'll call it a virgin territory. They don't know. Right. right. So usually under those scenarios, the franchisor, I find at least a lot of franchisors I've worked with in the past, they're cool with it. But the franchisee has to understand they're at risk of losing that territory and building a customer base for somebody else. So a lot of times the franchisee will do that as kind of like a try it before you buy it, right? And then build right. it up a little bit and then buy the territory with the cash flow they're generating in that virgin territory. Yeah, so, and then usually the franchisor, if there's interest being generated in those scenarios, they'll tell the franchisee, okay, it's time to pull the trigger or we're gonna award that territory and those potentially that those customers, uh, if that's what their agreement says to somebody else. And that's the risk of developing outside your territory. Then you can ask, well, why would they do it? And that's where it comes back that maybe their territories are too small. Uh, maybe they weren't defined correctly. Uh, maybe you know they maximized you know, their opportunity one particular territory, and they want to scale without making the investment. You know, so there's a bunch of reasons people do that. But that's the kind of the risk and the reward of it all. Uh, the the worst case scenario, Rainey, is when you get to this situation where it already plays out now. Somebody's buying it, and the other person doesn't want to give it up because they think they already own it because they're doing business there already. Right. Right. And so th so that's a that's a level of entitlement uh, that I think uh, we're going through the FEDs. I would show people that. Right. You know, the, your, this is protected, and this you know, isn't. You can do business over there. But somebody also can acquire that territory. I do get those questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I hear what you're saying, Christian. I, I, might, I would, I think I would leave it where uh, there are businesses that territory is less relevant uh, in the digital age and virtual age uh, than other businesses, and then some businesses are still just flat out local. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. I didn't think we'd get it to this level of a robust discussion. I'm about ready to toss this deck. This is actually, to me, all the good stuff that makes it is all the good stuff. I'm, I probably just got a lot of crap going on here. Now, so I'll answer the relevant stuff. So, uh, yeah, I got to anybody read the uh, Principles of Influence with Dr. Robert Cialdini? So, it's kind of a best selling marketing book for the last 30 years. So, um, he also did a series of seminars, right? So I recommend everybody not read that book because the book epically sucks. It's like one of those books that uh, the seven habits, like it's better to read a summary than to go out and all that stuff, right? That's out there. But the audio, if you can find it, is breathtaking. So I tell you, read the audio because he's, he's more anecdotal. And the book, he's, he talks like a scientist. Right. But the principles are influence. One of his principles of influence is it, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you say before you say what you say. In other words, how are you framing it up? Right. So for me, the FDD requires framing up. 
So, you know, part of our process is we send our candidates this article wrote about how to read an FDD. I could send it to you guys if you want to read it because you know, obviously it's more shameless book plugging, right? But it talks about what's in the, you know, what are the 23 items? And when you read an FDD, what should you be looking for, you know, in those 23 items? Plus some content on what really defines the relationship, right? So I would say the contract uh, doesn't define the franchisee for franchise or relationship. It's more of a social contract, you know, which is why in problem solving, you know, you don't, or they're in conflict, they don't whip out the agreements, right? They get people on the phone and they talk things through. The agreements is the kind of case of last resort when everything else is breaking down. So I do like uh, have them pre-frame it by maybe having them watch some educational video that you guys do. You know, the article I wrote, there's there's other articles uh, on FDD that other people wrote that aren't as good as what I wrote, kidding. Uh, and uh, and then, but, but frame it up, right? Uh, we also talk about when I'm, like I'm recruiting for Sandler and a little bit of pliables. And, you know, when we're doing the uh, FDD, before I send out an FDD, I even limit them to reading the first 23 items because it's plain English. And I say all the attachments, that's that's stuff you need later in the process. It's all referenced and outlined in the first 23 items. So let's just focus our attention there. Uh, and that seems to work uh, extremely well. So it limits you know, the, the FDD review from six hours, 10 hours or whatever, or having to hire an FDD to two hours. With it was things that they can understand with a pad text. Uh, questions on that? Okay. And I, you know, I, I'm not one. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with the scenario. I just sent them an FDD, and I hope they don't read it. You know, I think uh, that's leaving too many things up to chance. I've had, I've been with concepts where the franchisor would say, just give it to them. Uh, if they read it, they read it. If they don't, they don't. In other words, they're really comfortable and with uninformed investors. I'm not comfortable with that. I want people to know what they're committing to and have a, a good working street knowledge of what it is they're signing. So they understand what the risk is. And then obviously they you know, they buy it for the reward. Anybody have a, a different philosophy uh, than what I just spouted? And then some don't, we'll send them the FDD, but not review it with them. Now I'll tell you, depending on the sophistication of the person I'm talking to, I might do that too. So like, uh, you know, pliables, we, we deal a lot with uh, large multi-unit diversified franchisees of other systems. Well, they know what an FDD is. They know how to read it. Uh, you know, so we might send it to them. You know, I don't feel the need to go through all 23 items with them unless they've never owned a franchise before. Uh, you know, I might send it to them and just say, let's you know, let's go over any issues that you might have, you know, in another conversation, but you know, less framing potentially needs to be done. Or if we're doing something that might be a little different uh, than another brand, uh, I might point that out. Like with pliables, uh, I was going through an FTD review and someone said, well, I don't get to protect the territory. I said, yes, you do. You know, pliables, the way they word it is you don't get a protected territory unless you're in compliance. And if you're in compliance, you know, then we agree not to put another franchisee in, you know, within this within this trade area. I was like, well, that's protection, right? <laughs> no, it's just a different way of saying and and, and and in a different way of communicating and quite frankly, more a little bit more confusing you know, than saying you do have a protected territory. So most franchisors say you do have a protected territory unless you do these things. Uh, pliables would say you don't have a protected territory unless, unless you're in compliance and do all these things right. And then then it's protected as long as you're doing these things. But it's just, just a little bit confusing and requires some explanation. So that's something that section I'll probably always kind of point out up front because it will be read wrong predictably. Questions on that? So just know your FDD and know how it lands, right? And, you know, where people uh, predict, you know, where you hear patterns of agita, I would tell you, address those patterns of agita up front. Everybody know what agita is? Or am I the only half Italian on the phone? 
Colucci, what's Ajita? I can't even answer that question. I'm not Italian enough. I'm only, <laughs> believe it or not, for for a uh, for a paisan, I'm only like a quarter. I'm mostly English and Scottish. I so looked across got... the street from Fort Colucci's. They were right off the boat. They could tell you that. <laughs> so Ajita's stomach is Italian for his upset stomach. Mm. Okay. So anything that gives you upset stomach and you hear it again and again, address those things up front. Okay. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. I would like to go through the items that might give people agita and just kind of tell me how do you deagitize if that is a word. Uh, Colucci obviously can't tell me if that's a word because he's not Italian enough. Uh, deagitize these particular items. Or how could you present these in a way that adds value to the brand and adds value to the offer? So like item two, bios. Does anybody ever go through the bios of leadership to, to show that they're worthy of a following? Like, uh, I'll just use pliables, for instance. You know, the CEO is the, you know, the COO of Papa Murphy is at 1,500 units. So, you know, he's the a chain at 300 units hasn't grown into his executive capacity yet. So I do think shown bios of executives have already been there. And I've already grown out brands and created, uh, you know, massive equity uh, for franchisors and franchisees is important to point out. Uh, litigation, do you guys talk about item three at all? So, um, Christian, you're not in your head. Tell me what you would say about item three. What if there is no litigation? Ah, well, fortunately, I don't have that problem, right? I got history that dogs me from when we bought the company. Yes. But uh, I, I think that's just a function of explaining them. You know, if you look at uh, the litigation, we, you know, we've had next to no litigation since we've owned the company. Um, but it's going to happen from time to time. I'm not saying we're perfect, but uh, at the end of the day, I would agree. L l low litigation doesn't mean that we don't screw up, but I would say it means we solve problems. That's and I also, the key. That's and I would also say that. we're not the ones who usually pick the fights. Right. Yeah. Do you ever ask a candidate if they have litigation or they've ever litigated? Yep. Right. Because that's exactly what we're not looking for. Right. Right. If we right. can avoid it. Yeah. At the end of the day, if if you know, you should only be litigating if we can't get on the phone and have a civilized conversation. Excellent. Excellent. So so sometimes if you have litigation, it's good to walk things through that, like how it got to be where it is and how how you resolve it. But if you have low litigation. I, I think that's a testimony. Look, it says it's not because we don't have problems or not because we're not in conflict from time to time with our franchisees. It's because we're adults and we work it out. Yeah, right. We respect what each other brings to the table and we just work it out like commercially minded uh, strategic partners should that have something to lose, right? If we don't work it out. Okay. Uh, bankruptcy. So uh, we have to disclose officers in the company's ten years uh, track record in bankruptcy. How would we, how would we present that? Anybody ever have to walk talk through that? What would you say if there's no bankruptcy? We cover or not financially responsible. That, that's yeah. yeah the, uh, people are financially responsible. Yeah. In a bankruptcy is a legal maneuver, right? But somebody who should get paid isn't, you know. So it could be legal, but is it ethical and and moral? That would be, you know, the issue, right? So, but if uh, if there's no bankruptcies, it be, could, presumably everybody is supposed to get paid is, uh, and that that goes along. That should go a long way in a commercial relationship. Um, initial investment. This is where I, I. This is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Like yeah, you know, this, this this is the F, this is where the FDD is designed. Like somebody from the federal government would absolutely design it. What's the absolute least it could possibly be? What's the most it ever was? And let's disclose the two poles that you're almost certainly never going to hit, right? And we'll call that the FDD, right? So how do you guys present the initial investment? You guys get into what's a predictable middle. Mm -hmm. I just describe I'm, it as a range, Joe, and I tell people it doesn't mean it couldn't possibly be higher than the highest or or possibly lower than the lowest. I describe it as a look back. 
Mike. That's do what you the give them. Uh, do you give them a target or an average? Yeah, of course. I go right to the middle of it. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I describe it as a. I, I give them the context of look. This is a a look back, right? Yeah. Look back at the last thirty locations we've opened. You know, and and throw out the outliers, and then what you're looking at is the range there, and and so the middle is you know whatever that number is. Good. Somebody else said something they wanted to add to that. Christian. So so I I kind of look at it. I mean, it's kind of advantageous, I guess, for me because I run in two countries, and the way we disclose the initial investment in Canada is much more based on what's the real capital requirement yes rather than every nickel and dime that you're possibly going to spend so uh for us i i build ours out in our item seven as here's the absolute highest that it can be if you have all the bells and whistles and then i look at what would really qualify for uh financing out of that and what are your what are your all your costs with you if you were to go with an sba loan what would all right. the costs be with your 90 day payment, your your initial downstroke, run that together and there's your number. And <clears throat> nobody's usually ever right at the lowest. And you're usually pretty good. Yes. So yeah, so you're giving it real context and real world applications of uh what that investment level is. Yeah, I've been, given time, I'm gonna shortcut this a little bit because I want to make sure we spend a lot of time on item 19, because I think that's uh, one of the most important and probably under, you, even though a lot of people have item 19, I still think it's underutilized from a strategic standpoint, right? Uh, but franchisors should be able to protect their marks uh, and um, renewals and transfers, they are what they are. Uh, and then item 20, uh, if you're in growth or decline, you got to have a story around that. Uh, but item 19 gets cl deals closed. So I've had attorneys uh, a long time ago tell me you, you, you can't use item 19 information in advertising. I've always rejected that argument because that's not what the FTC says. The FTC says that if you present an item 19, okay, it's got any earnings information has to be in the item 19. It doesn't say under any circumstance that you can't extract information and pull it forward, right? So we've always uh, took the posture of taking the risk and putting item 19 advertising in the advertising. Item 19 information in the advertising, because quite frankly, it makes the ads work better. Uh, Jason, what's the difference between an ad uh, with item 19 information leading with the numbers versus you know leading with some warm, fuzzy, be your own boss type copy? I mean, it's 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 night and day. It's, you know, getting qualified leads or people inquiring about, you know, where can I get a slice of your pizza, right? I mean, it's leading with the investment opportunity and giving them a peek into the potential future uh, versus, you know, the, the, the catchy play on words, for lack of a better term. So, so I was telling you, I recruit for Sandler. I think Sandler's, um, I made some recommendations. So the way Sandler ramps up, is it starts out slow for a couple of years and then just getting momentum and steam. And for the franchisees that have been around 10 years, it's it's a money generating machine that's it goes on autopilot. Uh, and it's also a high quality of life. Uh, but they, you know, they, they just, you got to be in it for the long haul. So it's kind of like you pay your dues at the beginning. And unless you're going to be in it for seven to 10 years, don't buy it. But the item 19 it never said that. They used to have no at night to 19 and the first one just gave the ramp up without the payout. So now we've got a new item 19. So how we're stacking the information and pulling it forward is, you know, this is a hundred thousand dollar investment. So the uh, average franchisees have been out there, mature franchisees, they've got you know, almost a million dollars a year business with a break even point of about 2,500 a month. Okay. And 92% margins if they're doing the work themselves. Now, 900,000 over a million, that's not a one person shop. They're probably uh, working with other franchisees to do some deliveries. So there might be some variable labor cost in that, but it's an individual producer's model. So you get to about six or 700,000 sales. So this is a guy, um, I've been around 10 years on a $100,000 investment. He was pulling down 
a half million to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year or more when you model it out. Mm. You know, then there and then also has you know if you take three or four times that earnings uh, has an asset uh, of you know well into uh, the seven figures that they've got a hundred grand to do. So it's a, it's a tremendous equity building model. It might be the best investment a franchisee makes, even in real estate or uh, you know, at all, even if the market's paying you know, 10 or 15% a year. Uh, the median would be 660, which is more of that individual producer model, but still, yeah, 2,500 bucks a month. And then uh, it would be fixed or thereabouts. And then 92% above that flows through to the bottom line. Huge money maker. So what's the payout, right? So you got to be able to, uh, the whole purpose of having an item 19, right, is to identify the payout. Because we, 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 we do a really good job identifying the risk in the FTD. What's the payout? You know, I think we do, uh, as a community, probably not as great a job. And then, uh, you know, and then the Sandler's going to the ramps, right? So... If you're break even, let's say they're going to find out. We don't present the break even, obviously, but the break even is thirty thousand dollars or thereabouts a year. Okay. Well, here's franchisees in the first term of the agreement, one to five years. So, you know, they're making. Yes, mean uh, would be three thirty five meeting, which is the real middle, one hundred sixty one. So you start getting into six figures. Uh, but then when you get into that six to 10 year mark, you know, you just start seeing it ramping up and then going back to uh, 10 years plus, right? You see just consistent, uh, oh, pardon me. This is the average here. 10 years plus, you start seeing significant payout, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a slow, steady wins the rice model. So if somebody's looking to make a quick buck or quick killing, in a pump and dump operation, you know, make their money and sell out fast. But this isn't the model. But if somebody's looking for something slow, steady, okay, with once it's built, you get into the flywheel and have a high quality of life. Uh, this is a really, really good model. And within also all the kind of intrinsic things that go along with it, like making a difference in the lives of others. Um, anybody see any really uh, intelligent ways? Of presenting the data that's you know different. And that really makes the case. So Sandler used to just present this. Doesn't really tell the story, does it? Yeah, I, I just called on you didn't hear me. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I love item 19s, yeah. right? I probably sound like I'm a freak here, but I really like item 19s because you get to really slice and dice your data a bunch of different ways yeah. to figure out how you want to tell a story. So uh, one of the things that we do internally, uh, we have a requirement that franchisees are supposed to report their internal financials to us. Yeah. And we just measure like three or four critical things out of that, you know, that we call our thumbprint. And you, you can tell from the thumbprint, you know, I don't even have to look at the P&L to know. If your thumbprint's off, I know exactly how you're performing and I know where the problem is. Right. But uh, what's been really interesting is the stores that, for whatever reason, you always get some outliers that just don't want to do this thing, right? Right. And the ones that don't, um, their average performance is 50% or less of what the stores that do. Yeah. You know, so I put that information in there and I create that and I uh, have a separate piece for it. And I'll tell you, it's really, really effective to just say, you know, you probably, if you're looking at other brands, you see it all the time. Whenever they're trying to justify somebody's a crummy performer, well, they just don't follow the system. Here you go. Here's what happens when stores don't follow the system versus yeah. stores that do. Yeah, doing um, doing item 19 with compliance versus non-compliance is really interesting. It, it actually will raise uh, the sales of those that are in compliance, right? Because we have Absolutely it does. Yeah. Right. I, I do think I, I had, I've had ghost conversations with franchisors about stripping out non-compliant stores and disclosing that in the N19 for that reason. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, my, one of my favorite uh, sayings on behaviors: uh, "How you do anything is how you do everything." Yes, right. 
Okay. So if people aren't sending you numbers and they're not compliant. Well, guess what? Uh, they're probably non-compliant in many other areas of their lives and business you know, also. Uh, and that would be the recipe for non uh, poor performance. Yeah, but it, it's effective. It's really yeah. effective for that conversation. It works well. Very good. Thank you. That's a good share. Uh, on the pliables, this is kind of what we're doing. We take the item 19 information. We put a story to it. So what story does this tell, Corey? I like that. That's neat. You're on mute. I was saying, well, it tells the story that you probably shouldn't look so hard at Jamba or Smoothie King. Um, that's kind of what I say. But um, yeah, the, the point I make is, yeah, wow, ooh, ah, look at the difference in the in the AUVs, you know, dollar wise. But we have a lot of green space uh, to grow on the number of locations, too. Um, and, and that seems to land pretty well. Yeah. And then what happens as the as the uh, chain grows? Do average unit volume sale, sales go down, or does the rising tide raise all? Well, share? well, I think conventional wisdom would say that that um, AUVs actually go up. Right. Um, in, and in Playa's case, we can point to uh, the most densely, you know, populated areas or, or where we have the most density, which is in the Northeast, and, and that's exactly the area where we have the highest AUV. So. Right. It's playing out um, there as well. And we, we, of course, point that out. Excellent. The other thing I like about what this shows is materially, it's the <laughs> same inventory. Like, and, and materially, the same equipment package, right? And materially, the same size locations, and therefore, materially, the same investment. Um, but, but Ply's just got a better mousetrap, right? And the evidence is they're doing twice the average sales. The other thing I like about Playa, um, they they put their lowest volume store in there too. So their lowest volume store is six hundred thousand in the item nineteen. And I was talking to somebody. I said, "So Playa's lowest volume store is still higher than the national average of this thousand unit chain." And those, you know, and they can still make the numbers work at five sixty one. So if your worst case scenario is you're the lowest volume store you're probably still going to be okay. You'll survive that one. So so that's how you can kind of put some word stories and do comparative research uh, to uh, to tell a better, uh, you know, just a better brand story. Okay. And then, you know, Playa, they just, you know, they go by quartiles. We don't do anything by geography though, right, Corey? There's no... Uh, no. geographical supplemental earnings right now no there's not but the fourth quartile i mean you're averaging well above as i tell people if you're in the lowest 25 percent of pliables you average at almost 900k yeah so if you're if you're failing uh you're still doing better than uh, statistically doing better than uh what, what was before the highest volume uh smoothie and juice chain which is jamba juice so yeah, so you, you fail up yeah you know, with with uh, with pliables, right? And that's why we're adding how many yeah three to four franchises, new franchises a month with them. Yeah, we've, we've I think I think we've sold uh, FPG have sold uh, eighty one uh, about to be over a hundred here by the end of the month. Um, new locations for them this year. Yeah, and they're all going to get open too. Yeah, it's not a hundred pie in the sky because we ordered so well to your, to your point i mean it, it really isn't a sale it, it, it's more of a, a of a you know it's more of an introduction and a in a matching and you know we eliminate people regularly for that yeah thing. and then corey coming from a restaurant development background doesn't put together unrealistic development territories okay so that's that's kind of like where we are with the ftd the other thing we didn't talk about is if you multi-unit development territories yeah you know, just make sure their realistic development schedules you know, that, that people could realistically attain. Otherwise, you're in the business of securing deposits. You're not in the business of making uh, franchisees successful. Okay. So uh, quick, these are my takeaways uh, that, you know, identifying resolve deal killers quickly. Uh, always give context, right? Otherwise, they're going to create context. Remember that uh, listening exercise we did with 28 sheep? Right. That's that's 
what people do with the FDD. It's like 28 sheep uh, in motion. Um, work through potential deals of conflict up front. Okay, make sure they're prepared for the call. I want them to read the FDD. I don't want to work off a of hope. What are some of your best practices as it relates to FDD? Anything we didn't cover? Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to assume we check that box and we're ready to move on. Now, let's see, everybody remember that the, um, the cost of content here is free plus one random act of kindness. Okay. So if anyone wants to extend a random act of kindness my way, not pardon the shameless book plug, but it comes out October 15th, and I'd like to make the uh, publisher proud they did business with us. Uh, so the hard copy is uh, being delivered on October 15th in the pre-sell. Uh, what sells books isn't me. What sells books is uh, the reviews. So if anybody uh, wanted to do a review, uh, I'll send you a free book. You just got to read it, okay, and just and then just review. Uh, so I've got a, I get a allotment of about 100 books. So I'll do something good for you guys if you boomerang it back. Uh, agree to read it and put up a review on Amazon. Uh, just let me know. Just email me, uh, Joe at Franchise Performance Group, and I'll put you on the list. Is there an audio book? Uh, there will be, just not in October, probably before the year end. And then there's a there's going to be digital versions on October fifteenth too. They're thought, thinking about taking you know, creating textbook out of it and and bring it to universities and stuff. So we're pushing the hard copy. I would I would take I would take Joe up on the review and free book because he's making everyone at FPG pay for the book. So you know, just say well, because they're advantage. overpaid and they don't work hard. <laughs> so there's a reason for that. That's okay. right. Happy to do so. Look forward to it. Can't yeah, wait to Leslie probably sold more books of Street Smart Franchise than I did. So uh, thank you, Leslie. This is by far, like, this is my swan song. This is like 41 years. I'm never going to write another book on franchising. Like, this is it. So I took the bat out and I started swinging. And I um, and the big key thing, I think, if we could digress, um, you know, there's a movement towards responsible franchising, but nobody knows what it is, how to define it, or how to implement it. So what I tried to do was, uh, in 75,000 words and 350 pages, give it definition so people can implement it. Uh, and then they could debate whether that is or there isn't franchi uh, responsible franchising, but uh, to create a conversation around that. But thank you, Leslie, I appreciate you guys. All right, everybody, have a great rest of the day. It was good talking to you, Jason. We're signing off.